Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Causes or Cures. I'm Dr. Eeks, your host, and thanks for tuning in to this episode. This is a little longer introduction, so fast forward if you want. I've been trying to post podcast at a more regular pace, but sort of fell out of sync in the last few weeks due to, well, you know what it is, life, family, friends, worldly events, work. <clears throat> Anyhow, I spent the last few weeks editing podcast I had already recorded, so I am going to be posting a lot of new episodes in the coming days, and I hope you find a couple of them interesting, including a few shoot the breeze ones with guest host that some subscribers will have access to. All the interviews I do with experts and interesting people, however, will continue to be available to everyone, so no worries there. Which brings me to today's episode. Today, I'm chatting with Michelle Slater, author of the book, Starving to Heal in Siberia, My Radical Recovery from Late Stage Lyme Disease. I've started to interview more authors on here, all with various backgrounds and interests. They send me their book to read, hard copies, of course, because I like to read and go crazy with my highlighter at the same time, and then I read them, and then I have a conversation with the author on the podcast. Michelle's story struck my interest because one, I was super intrigued by Siberia and what would make someone go there to feel better? Like, I'm so cultured, I only thought of ice and snow and prisons when I thought of Siberia, and now I'll think of dry fasting. And two, I'm always fascinated by why why people try certain modes of healing. Like, why do people try alternative approaches to healing along with conventional medical approaches? Or why do people try something unconventional versus something conventional when, you know, the conventional approaches are evidence-based, have to go through a bunch of trials and get approved by regulatory bodies? Why would somebody do that? And real quick here, it's not as simple as saying, they're all quacks, right? Some people love saying that, quacks. They tend to hang out together on Twitter. Um, but I looked into this a little bit. I looked at a survey from Pew Research Center from 2017 that showed 50% of the general public in, here in the US reported having tried alternative medicine. And about 30% said they tried it along with conventional medical treatments. Younger people were more likely than people over 65 to try alternative medicine, and there was no difference, no differences in gender or education. The National Health Interview Survey by the CDC showed that people with chronic conditions are more likely to use alternative treatments, also what was found in the Pew Research Center. And let's make a note here, alternative medicine, when I'm talking about it here, is an umbrella term for herbal therapies, acupuncture, chiropractic, energy therapies, and so on and so forth. And it makes sense to me that people with chronic ailments would try alternative therapies more because they often try a lot of the conventional stuff first. They do. And when that doesn't work, they look for other ways to get some relief. The Pew Research Center survey also showed that a majority of Americans, when it comes to health or medical decisions, do do their own research in addition to hearing what their doctor has to say. I know, you know, do your own research, do your own research, um, <laughs> has become this meme-friendly slogan in present times, but most Americans actually do it. Another survey of over 1,000 people, this was published in JAMA in 1998, so some years ago now, keep that in mind, but I'm not so sure humans' desires, motivations change that fast. Um, but that showed that the majority of people who tried alternative medicine were more educated and reported a poor health status. The poor health status makes sense. Again, you're looking for relief, right? The more educated part is interesting. Maybe they question conventional things more in general. They don't accept things so easily. I don't know. The majority of alternative medicine users also did not report being dissatisfied with conventional medicine, but they found alternative approaches to be more in line with their personal beliefs and philosophies. 
The discussion went on to describe them as holistic and that they prioritize body, mind, and spirit when it comes to health. I think, too, there may be a strong connection between mind and body, perhaps spirit, if you believe in a spirit, when it comes to a lot of chronic conditions. And I'll actually talk more about that in a future episode on chronic pain featuring Dr. David Clark. The alternative medicine users were also called cultural creatives, people who prioritize self-actualization, spirituality, our connection with the environment and world around us. I say this a lot, and it's interesting to think about as folks wage war on misinformation because misinformation kills or whatever else the trending slogan is. But if people believe in a spiritual dimension, their entire outlook to health and, well, life in general could be very different than a body-only person. And also, side note here, but not including religious dogma and what people do with religious dogma, given how much it influences policies, governments, and wars, as dangerous information or potentially dangerous information is the epitome of irony to me. But you have to wait for my YouTube video on that. <laughs> and one last thing before I connect with Michelle, I have to say this, just to be abundantly clear for our painfully reductive dog eat dog cancel this cancel that world. I am not saying go to Siberia and do dry fasting. I do not endorse going to Siberia or anywhere and doing dry fasting. I do not practice medicine, so I'm not giving out any sort of advice here. And if you are an American, I don't think you can even go to Siberia now because of, well, war. But one day I would like to go to Siberia because it intrigues me. Um, and I do practice intermittent fasting, which I've talked about on previous episodes, but I eat food and drink water with lemon every day. I don't believe I'd survive without at least my lemon water every day, but that's me. And that's part of the reason why I was so intrigued by Michelle's story. But to be clear, this podcast is to chat with a woman about her fascinating book that I just read and learn more about why and how she went to such great lengths to find her path to healing, okay? It's a conversation, not news, not advice. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but I feel like you have to do that in today's world. Um, it's just, you know, a conversation about an interesting book and story, all right? So I'm gonna shut up now and connect to Michelle. One second here, guys. All right, everyone, we are connecting here with uh, Michelle Slater, and she is the author of Starving to Heal in Siberia, which I read, um, and it's uh, about her recovery from late stage Lyme disease. And I have to tell you, Michelle, I really enjoyed your book just because, well, first of all, I've always been fascinated about Siberia in general, and <laughs> I was like, wow. Um and then, you know, just uh, Lyme disease, I know quite a few people who struggle with that. Uh, and a lot of people are looking for um, cure, you know, it, it's a constant battle, basically. And uh, even when I was up at, uh, at Cadet at West Point, a lot of people caught Lyme disease um, when they were, you know, we would sleep in the field and during field training and that kind of thing. So it was always on our minds, like, oh, this could happen to you. But before we kind of dive into your health journey here. Uh, can you tell us a little more about yourself? I know you have a PhD. Uh, you're a good writer. Just tell us a little bit about you. Uh, well, thank you, Erin, for saying such nice things, for reading my book and being interested in, in this um, fascinating topic. Uh, let's see about myself. Yes, I do. I do have a PhD from Johns Hopkins, but not in the medical realm, uh, in the humanities, actually in French literature, comparative literature, also studied philosophy. So I'm trained as an academic. I was a professor at the university until I became very sick with Lyme. Um, and apart from that, I've always just been a curious person about the world, enthusiastic, and I like to hike, run marathons, and ski, and meditate, and generally, you know, um, share goodness with, with others in this world. And um, since, since 
my recovery from Lyme, which I know we will discuss in depth, I've, I've really been writing a lot. So I haven't been teaching at the university, but I have written not just this book, but a few others that are in the, in the um, works now in the publishing process. And well, there you have it. All right, great. Thank you. So Lyme disease, um, I, I thought maybe, can you just tell us a little bit about when you were first diagnosed, when you first realized you had Lyme disease? Yes, th that, that in itself is such a complicated question because as you know, from living in the Northeast, although Lyme is pervasive now really throughout the world, even in Siberia, you'll see signs being careful about ticks. Um, so I, 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 I was always, it was always in my mind, but I didn't, um, you, you don't always get the classic bullseye rash, which I didn't get. You don't always see the tick, they're microscopic. And so in my case, it became, it was very difficult to diagnose uh, and it's difficult for me even to tell you today what the start date was of the line because I had, I found a tick in, I think it was 2011, but it had been sick before then. It was mysterious. It was, and no one was diagnosing me with Lyme disease. And even after that tick bite, um, I didn't, um, I didn't test positive for Lyme disease. So it wasn't really until um, so when I was writing the manuscript, I had all of the dates in my medical papers right in front of me, and I could tell you right off the bat, you know, what the date was of the diagnosis. But I, I, I want to say it was in the summer of 2013 that I had so many mysterious, alarming symptoms, and and I, I was just on this relentless search to find out what could be wrong with me. Um, so I think it was at that time that I was diagnosed with Lyme. 2013. So you actually had, uh, they tested your antibodies, drew your blood, um, you got, I got an actual diagnosis. Absolutely. And I yeah. had done, you know, I had done the, the various different, there's the Western block, the IgG, all the, the different tests. So I had, um, I had, but that is another problem that you can get a false negative. You can get a false positive testing um, had not been entirely reliable either. But in the late summer of 2013, I absolutely had a diagnosis. And my uh, I went to see my general practitioner who gave me this sort of perfunctory 30-day 200 milligrams of doxycycline. And I felt like I had taken candy, like it didn't, it, it I still felt horrible. So I went back to him. He gave me another 30 days of doxycycline. And I was not better. And so I just kind of muddled along that year. And um, and then the following summer in 2014, it got so progressively bad that I was just exhausted all the time. I couldn't think. Uh, I was um, I had to slide down the stairs on my bum to get from my bedroom down to the kitchen. And I went to see a real Lyme specialist, not my general practitioner, a very well-respected Lyme specialist, Dr. Stephen Phillips in my area of Connecticut. And he ran a comprehensive panel of um, blood tests that included things that a general practitioner just wouldn't be aware of, um, like specialized white blood cell tests. And he talked to me, he asked me multiple detailed questions about my symptoms. And they were, it was, it was just ding, ding, ding. Like, yes, I have had that. And yes, I have had that. And, um, and he told me that the Lyme disease had been with me for a very long time based on my numbers and my white blood cell counts being depressed and such. So my very long answer to your simple question is that it's hard to say when I was really, uh, when I first really came down with Lyme disease, because I'd had these strange symptoms for a good few years before I had any kind of diagnosis in hand. And this story, Erin, is so similar to many out there, of people who were sick for years, didn't know why, and then finally they get this diagnosis of chronic Lyme, and then it's very hard to eradicate. So that is the sad and frustrating part of having Lyme disease, one of them. Right, right, right. And I, I definitely... Um... Have heard stories like that before, and and because and Lyme 
you know, you it can present with many different symptoms and you could just be tired. Like you said, you, you're not going to see maybe the bullseye rash on you or like the tick. Um, but you know, it, you, you have it and you, there's no way you're not really connecting like, Oh, maybe this is Lyme disease. Um, so you mentioned you're in Connecticut. That's a uh, Lyme, Connecticut, right? That was Connecticut is where, yeah. <laughs> is where they first, first, they first found yeah. discovered it's a hotbed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, and just thinking about tick-borne illnesses in general, um, and, and from your book, and obviously you're very active, you're hiking, you're running, like, so am I. I'm always, that's always in the back of my head, though. I'm like, you know, all the, it's not just Lyme disease, there's so many other types of um, tick-borne illnesses out there. So you have, so you get diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease. Uh, you tried the antibiotic, the, uh, subs, you know, first dose, second dose, whatever. What else did you try? Again, the list is long. That's yeah. also, also the list is long. So once I once uh, my Lyme specialist uh, was able to discover that I had chronic Lyme, which he called late stage neurological Lyme because I had so many neurological symptoms presenting, I I could really I could no longer finish a sentence. I couldn't. I, I I couldn't think you could ask me a question and I couldn't even answer because I had forgotten what the question was within seconds. This was really unlike me. And I had joint pain everywhere. I had Lyme migraines and Lyme insomnia and a whole host of things, including this debilitating fatigue, which I just couldn't shake no matter how much I rested. So with my Lyme specialist, he put me on not 200 milligrams, but 1500 milligrams of doxycycline along with an antimicrobial. And he did it in a pulsed, um, in a pulsed way so that it would be on and off to save my stomach. And also um, with the Jerish Herxheimer reactions of the, of the spirochetes dying off, it would catch them in cycles and and have a better chance of killing off more spirochetes in in the body. So I went through this and I did and I did feel as he said that I would significantly worse on account of the Lyme die off. But I wasn't feeling like after these periods of feeling worse that I was bouncing back and feeling better. And so I continued with my arsenal of um, alternative therapies as well. I tried to read peer-reviewed articles of different treatments. And when, and when that failed, I decided that everything was on the table to try. I tried a whole host of supplements. I read, I read every book that I could find and reading was excruciatingly difficult. My, the words were dancing on the page. I couldn't focus. I couldn't remember things. So th even the research process was very difficult, but I tried I tried the Rife machine, this electrical um, pulsing modes that are supposed to help with die off. Um, I tried far infrared saunas. Um, I had always had a very clean diet. So I was already, you know, dairy free, gluten free, low glycemic, eating organic fruits and vegetables. But I, I was very strict with my diet. Um, you know, I cut out coffee. Um, I, I tried Reiki, acupuncture, um, the list is so long. Um, so I had, you know, I had tried all of these, all, all, all of these various things and it was just getting worse. I just, I was at the point where I was in my bed most of the time. I was very uncomfortable if I had to get out of bed and I, and I didn't have any light. I just didn't have any light to share. And I'd always been someone who wanted to make a meaningful contribution to society. And I had nothing to contribute. I just felt like I was a burden on everyone. So I started look, getting really serious about last ditch efforts. And, and during this time where you were still working with your Lyme specialist? I stopped seeing him after a couple of years because because I wasn't getting better. We even tried a malaria medication that was even more, it was um, an extreme medication in for the case of, you know, patients who were really severely impacted. And, and I would have periods of, I would, I definitely felt improvement, but I was nowhere near my old self. And 
I just kept hearing from a variety of, you know, health practitioners that I had to adapt to this new normal. And it, it wasn't, it was so abnormal for me um, that, you know, since that wasn't working, I, you know, I sort of, I sort of gave up on, you know, taking that approach. You know, and, and reading that comes across in your book, you know, the first part of your book that you've like, you know, you've tried, you've gone to your doctors, your primary care doctor, you go to the specialist, you're trying all these things, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Um, and then like a lot of people who don't get better that way, they start to look at other alternatives. And I think um, that's something that we forget, you know, especially you, you see on Twitter, people are like, you know, oh, they talk about quackery, they talk about, oh, stay away from alternative medicines, oh, that stuff is all, you know, doesn't work and stuff like that. But I think we also have to remember, like, these are people who have tried a lot of things. So they look to other alternatives to see if something else will work. Because when you are in that, because it's clear from your book, you're in this desperate state, you just you want to get better, but it's like, where do you go? Um, right. And I think that uh, even, you know, people who practice Western medicine and traditional medicine need to be more empathic to that. You know, you, like, we, we may not know everything. And, and l let's stop, you know, ridiculing people who search for different things um because that's that's not healthy or helpful to anyone absolutely i i do want to say in on behalf of dr phillips when i did tell him that i was trying various supplements and even the rife machine he didn't dismiss them he wasn't dismissive he was an open doctor who you know accepted that combating chronic late stage lyme you had to sort of turn to a variety of sources it's just that it wasn't working. It wasn't, it wasn't, right. um, my healing wasn't coming. It wasn't coming. Okay. Okay. So how did you hear, you, you, we're, we're going to eventually take the story to Siberia <laughs> of all places. Um, so where did you first hear about a doctor in Siberia uh, doing fasting? Yeah. How did you first come across that? Yes, that I I will never forget this moment. I was because it was it was July of 2017 and um my husband was off on a trip um abroad with friends that I had been looking forward to but I couldn't go because I was I could not get out of bed. And so I was all propped up on pillows to try to get comfortable and I and I, I also I had developed the autoimmune disorder as well of psoriasis. So I, I I had these awful scaly patches up and down my arms and, and on my knees. And, you know, I was conscious of it in the summer when, you know, it's hot and everyone is wearing t-shirts and you are wearing a long sleeve shirt because, you know, it's unsightly. And so I was actually on a, on a, on a forum on my phone in bed, scrolling down and, and looking for, you know, maybe a solution for this psoriasis. And I'd also developed candida um, taking so many antibiotics that would come and go. So it was it was on that form, not even something for Lyme, that someone quoted this, this Dr. Filonov, who sounded sort of mythical because the quote was about how dry fasting or rather abstaining from food and water putting any food or water into the body whatsoever could incinerate diseased cells that in the absence of water for an extended period of time, say nine days is his medical, was the medical um, length of time to, to create this autophagy in the body, um, that, the, that it would be, the cells would become like thermonuclear reactors and incinerate these diseased cells. Somehow, that sounded so intriguing to me. And I thought, well, I know what autophagy is. I know what self-eating is of the body. I know how this, I've studied how this process works. This could actually work. And at that point, I was in my, I was so, I was so unlike my normal self that I had thought, um, like many people have with late stage chronic Lyme, that if I couldn't find a solution that I was going to commit assisted suicide. And I'm not even, I'm never, I've, I wouldn't ever go to such an extreme if I just thought 
I mean, I really felt like I was practically in a vegetative, vegetative state by that point. And so I was, so that's how I found out about him. And yeah, and, and that does, that comes across in your book, that desperation. And, and I think a lot of people get, get there, you know, when you don't feel like yourself and you're in pain and you feel like you can't control your health, it's like a hopeless state. I, I can, I can understand that. So now you, did you reach out to the doctor then? Um, or what, what were you thinking? Did you, I mean, when people, there's all this talk about intermittent fasting and fasting. Um, I've had a couple of people on talk about, you know, the evidence base for intermittent fasting, but that certainly doesn't involve restriction of water, which I think is the part that when I was reading your book, that that gave me like, oh, like, no, like that gave me like a gut feeling of like, oh, I would never do that. Like, that sounds really, really dangerous. And um, like, wow, she's going to that length now because like, she's struggling so much. So <laughs> just curious. I, I, and I understand, Erin. I mean, I, yeah. I juice fasted um, since I was like 17. I've been yeah. green juice fasting. And I always thought, oh, water fasting, that's so extreme. And so to skip out, well, he does water fasting as part of his prep, but to like skip beyond water fasting and go with no food or water. Um, yes, we, it, we have definitely um, been educated to believe that this would be very, very dangerous um, to life itself. So did you discuss, I know, I mean, there's parts of your book where you discuss with your family and your family is sort of very like, uh, hesitant at first. Um, (laughs) so what was that like, just kind of talking it over with people who were close to you, um, when you were considering, okay, maybe I'm going to do this. Maybe I'm going to contact this doctor. Maybe I'm going to go to Siberia. As soon as I read that quote, I knew I needed to contact the doctor. That in itself was a major challenge because his website was only in Russian. I was severely compromised with with my ability to concentrate. Um, My husband was Russian and so that was helpful. So when he came home from this trip, I pleaded with him and I couldn't to to contact the doctor after I had located his information um, on his Russian site. Now it's very easy to contact him really thanks to me and my book. And he now has a translator and a website in English. And it's now very easy to contact. At the time, I was his very first American patient. And it was not like that then. But my husband was also desperate. And so he contacted him and pleaded with him to take me as a patient. And Dr. Filanov wasn't even sure about taking an American patient with the uh, just political tensions between the two countries. So the whole entire process was, it it was not easy. There was pleading here, there was pleading there. My father was quite skeptical, um, but then supportive. And really from the beginning, um, I felt that I could trust this Dr. Filonov. He is an MD. And he, you know, he's not, he's not, um, he he has, he has real medical training and, and I, and I, and this somehow the science behind it made sense to me and I was willing, I was willing to try it. I knew that he'd practiced this for 30 years, that he hadn't lost a patient and that the dry fasting, which he uh, supervised medically endured for this period of nine days. He trained each body to do nine days because he says on the ninth day, that's when the autophagy kicks in and it can, it can get deeper into the body to, um, you know, clear out this cellular debris, which is what, you know, autophagy does. So knowing that I decided that I had absolutely nothing to lose. And, and I felt, I felt I felt okay going there. And just so for folks. As crazy as it sounded. <laughs> What's that? Sorry. As crazy as it sounded. No, I mean, uh, yeah, it does sound, it sounds very, like when you read it, you're like, oh, wow, she's going to such great lengths, you know, and you're just very curious about what's going to happen to you as, as you go through your book. Um, but Dr. Filanoff, uh, hopefully I'm not m- murdering that pronunciation, pronunciation, um, He's a medical doctor. Can you tell us a little, does he practice 
only in Siberia or like, or is he practicing medicine or is he just doing this dry fasting? Can you just tell us a little more about the person? Absolutely. So he comes from, a, he's from Siberia, from Barnaul in Siberia. And he comes from a long line of medical doctors um, and did his training at the university at the medical school there in Barnaul. Um, he, he gained an early interest in fasting on his own um, after a motorcycle accident. He, he had seen his dog fast and recover from a broken bone. And and he decided to do this himself. And he made this remarkable recovery. So he started studying it scientifically. And as it turns out, there is quite a history of fasting and medical fasting in Russia. And when he graduated from medical school, he became the medical director at a fasting clinic um, in Lake Baikal. And he was supervising water fasting retreats, which water fasting has has been practiced in, in Russia, you know, since the 19th century and possibly before. And he, he discovered, though, that the water fasting wasn't as curative as it maybe once had been. Maybe there are just more chemicals in the world that it's harder to, um, you know, clear, clear, um, you know, cellular, cellular compromised cells in the body. And he started experimenting himself with dry fasting and studying it. And then when he started to use it clinically, he had outstanding results with his patients over 30 years ago now. I would say maybe it's been 35 years. And he was seeing patients who had anything from rheumatoid arthritis to, um, infertility issues, um, skin diseases, um, first stage cancer, um, having these remarkable recoveries and returning to their former lives. And um, so then he branched out and started his own clinic, dry fasting, only dry fasting. So now for several years, he only takes patients for dry fasting and supervises them and takes them through this very precise process. And since um, since the war started in Ukraine, he has been unable to practice with his international patients in Siberia, which is incidentally very beautiful. And and so he's he he likes to practice um, the dry fasting with patients in a in a situation that's in nature so they can be outside while they're doing this. So he's he has found um places where he could do what I would call really a pop-up clinic in Turkey and in Montenegro. And actually I will be with him in Montenegro October 28th to November 8th to co-host. I will lead the meditations and provide support for the international patients um, while he's conducting. Uh, this dry fast. So that's that's a little bit of history about Dr. Filonov. He's also, I would say, he really has the heart of a medical doctor because he he doesn't overcharge. He's very conscious that people have paid a lot of money to get well and haven't gotten well, and he wants everybody to have a chance at getting well. So he doesn't have inflated prices. He doesn't have this fancy lifestyle. Um, he he just he has compassion for his patients. And um, I, I really respect him as a person, I'm not, I'm not only as my doctor. Um, well, that's good because you don't often hear that today, especially I mean, in the U.S., right? Like it's it's like you get sick, you could lose your house. It's uh, the cost of health care here is, um, well, ridiculous. It's and kind of it is. And, and for all these out, out, for all these treatments for Lyme disease that I mean, people like me are trying everything and they are so expensive and and a lot of these treatments are not covered by insurance and so it is it's it's and then you lose your you lose your job because you're not well enough to work so the plight of someone who has chronic disease not only Lyme but also you know these mystery diseases like chronic fatigue and autoimmune disorders it's a it's a severe burden on on one's life uh, overall. Um, so you mentioned that this practice was common in Russia. I know nothing about the Russian medical system or healthcare system. Um, but 
this is not approved by any medical body, right? Just let's like, we'll establish that for our listeners. I have no idea what Russian doctors can do in Russia versus, you know, I am more aware of the American system where this is obviously not something that is done here. But I would say that it's approved in the Russian medical system insofar as, you know, there, there have been state doctors who have conducted the psychiatric doctors who have conducted water fasts on patients with um, issues with um, with mental health, and and you know and so and and Dr. Pilonov is not conducting this as some sort of fringe treatment. You know he has a clinic. He practices it in his clinic, um, and the 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 study of autophagy, you know, has is a Nobel Prize winning um, scientific inquiry. And it's been, but it's been studied in Western medicine in labs with yeast cells rather than um, necessarily with patients undergoing nine day dry fasts. Um, but, but in Russia, it's, um, it wouldn't be considered a fringe practice from my understanding. Okay, okay. So tell us about when you get on the plane to go <laughs> to your, your, your packed, you're ready. Well, wait, no, let's first go. Cause you had to do some preparation work before you went. I had to do preparation work. There were things he wanted. He wanted me to stop taking all of my supplements and medications. He wanted me to conduct a one day dry fast, a three day dry fast um, at home alone before I went there to just clear preliminary preliminary things from the body because it's I I call it like marathon training you can't just wake up today and do a nine day dry fast I would not counsel anyone to do that I I write it all very clearly in my book starving to heal in Siberia about the protocols for prepping for a dry fast and coming out of the dry fast is very important as well so I he had me taking um, things to facilitate this detoxification process, like activated charcoal and um, baking soda in water, et cetera, and just reducing my cal- caloric load, which was already pretty low to begin with. Um, I didn't have much appetite being ill all of the time. Um, so I did all of those things before I went. And even the packing process, I had to rely on my husband for the packing. I could barely get out of bed even to go to the airport. And um, even the, the thought of being out of my bed and traveling through all of these airports, it's not easy to get to Siberia. So I was achy, I was sore, I was in pain, I was very uncomfortable just from my bed to get to whatever my new bed would be in Siberia. But I felt hopeful. I didn't, I knew that I was going to this place where people think of gulags and severe harsh conditions, but I had seen photos of the area and it looked somewhat like Vermont and there were mountains and rivers and wildflowers. And I thought this place looks very inviting. So I was really mostly, I was, I was hopeful that I was going to put myself in the hands of this doctor and that maybe this Maybe this was going to be it. So I had the fear that what if it doesn't work and I'm and I'm faced with, you know, this thought I'd been having about um, assisted suicide, but I was very hopeful. Um, would you consider this like a, this felt like a last resort effort for you? Yeah, I absolutely would call it that. That's That's how it felt to me. Okay, and your husband went with you. Uh, He went with me, he deposited me there, (laughs) um, made sure that these people were legitimate and would take good care of me. When he realized that they all had good hearts and they were friendly and warm and I was safe and he reassured my father, he took off to um, carry on. Um, He had some meetings in Asia and so he left me and then, um, and he left me there for two months. So I was, I was then there in, um, I was then to spend two months in Siberia and it, it's a very rustic place, but it's in the mountains. It's, it's away from, it's a five hour drive from Barnaul, the major city in Siberia. 
and um, it's 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 a very lovely, inviting place, as I described with mountains. Yeah, and you describe and- it beautifully in your book. I, so just because I think people are so intrigued, you're right. Like the image of Siberia is like snow, cold. Like you go there if you're a prisoner. Um, like right, like that's like the mainstream type of images we have. Or there's and then. I think I watched one movie with Keanu Reeves in Siberia. So you you get you go to the major city. What's what's that like? Can you just tell us a little bit about a little more about the the people, the culture, the buildings, if there are any, or if you know what what's it like? I mean, we really went straight from the airport in Barnaul. I discovered on my way out um, months later that you know Barnaul was it was a lovely. Russian city with parks and you know it was a thriving Siberian city um but we left we went straight from the airport and we made the over five hour drive and so we weren't really seeing any cities we were seeing villages and you know this lovely glacier like river so it was this light blue coming down from this glacial water and um there were rolling hills and you would see roadside stands of people selling honey or fruit. Um, I mean, it really looked like you were just in the countryside. It was very verdant. It was in August. And so it was, you know, flowers were blooming. And when I when we approached the clinic, it was down this long dirt road. So it wasn't even in a city or in a village. And it was this outcropping of rustic looking cabins by a river. Um, and, and the people who worked there, they were friendly, they were, they, they were kind, they were, they didn't seem severe or um, you know, like they were about to torture me, even though they were about to starve me. And I made a lot of jokes about that um, with my doctor. Um, not so funny, but you know the the irony of that starving in Siberia um, had to be the title. Um, so I so I just I was I was completely charmed by by this Siberia. I found it absolutely lovely. And you so you were there for two months, and you did too fast, right? Is that I did while I was there. He put me through a seven day fast. So I had done one day and three day at home and then seven. And then there's, there's a recovery period. And as he says, and I state in starving to heal, the exit is almost more important than the fast itself, because you have to get it right. You can't inundate your body with too much food, too much fluid, et cetera. So it's the quality and quantity that counts. So we did a, we did a recovery period and then um, I did a nine day fast of no food and no water with him. And then from that, there was an, almost a three week recovery period after that. So that that took up a good two months. Okay, okay, so there's the fast. So let's talk about the for the first fast because I think um, people are really curious, like how did you feel um, and how, how did they monitor you to make sure you know, you wouldn't fall over from dehydration, right? Like how, how did that, how did that all work? So I would say that I had felt tired and thirsty on the one day and on the three day, but while I was there, so there are several things. He likes you to sleep outside because you, you just have fresh air that you're breathing in because your body is really sensitive. It's taking everything in while you're dry fasting. So you have access to fresh air, the air that you're breathing. So I would sleep outside. He, I could barely walk. I had been, I had really been bedridden the last months before I went to Siberia largely. And he counseled me to go on these slow walks, which miraculously I was able to do. I think I I, I really wanted to get better so much. I was I was like finding this will from somewhere inside of me, but he also conducted um, treatments every day. He did detox, like um, liver massages that were meant to congest, decongest whatever was happening in. um, And I found that those were very helpful. The different massages that they conducted on the body to help break up um, congestion in the cells as the body was detoxifying. 
And, you know, and he monitored me medically, he took my heart rate, he took my blood pressure um, every day. And I, he, he was, he would, he would check in on me clinically, see if I had any symptoms. And by the time I reached the seven day, I, it was so much easier for me to drive fast. It really felt meditative. I just felt like I was at peace. Like my body was doing all this work inside and my mind could just take a break. I could just surrender to the process. And if anything, it felt like meditating, Erin. I felt I felt like I was in this peaceful, calm state. I wasn't stressed. I wasn't scared. Uh, I didn't even have a great deal of discomfort. Um, my, you know, it was in the summer and so there's moisture in the air. And so my mouth didn't even feel particularly dry. Um, I, it was, it was not as difficult as I would have expected. Okay. And then you also have other people there. Um, I don't know if they came, I, I don't recall if they were there for the second fast or their, during your first fast, but I know more people came to the. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So th there were a few people there during my first fast, but during the second one, while I was recovering from the first fast. So he would, he would run these clinics and I just had to go. He wanted me to be there as long as I could. So he took me outside of the regularly scheduled clinics he would run, but he would have maybe 30 people there at a time and no more than that because he observes everyone individually and he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to physically take on more than monitoring 30 patients at a time. So they were coming from all over, all parts of Russia. And so during my second fast, there were people there who were doing nine day dry fasts, all ages um, for, for that period of time, for the nine days. And there was another doctor there too, not just Dr. There was Paul. another doctor there. That's right. A doctor who lived in Italy and worked and practiced in Italy. Okay. So after your seven day fast, there's a period of recovery. Yes, absolutely. Rehydration. Rehydration. Um, okay. Yes. Slowly taking in fluids and then very harmless foods, you know, vegetable soups and, yeah. you know, things of that nature. Yeah, they have a kitchen they're, there. They're I mean, able to do more treatments. They they do cupping. They do, um, they do some practices that, you know, they 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 put leeches on my liver. That that was very difficult for me. That was maybe more difficult than the dry fasting for me <laughs> to have leeches on my on my liver. Um, but they they did a whole host of things after the dry fast to facilitate things being carried out of cellular debris being carried out of the body. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine that. The leeches. I yeah, I'm not sure I would have I don't think I would have lasted at all, but like um, but I I don't I don't know because I wasn't in the way you describe describe this was your last resort, like you were in so much distress. So maybe I would have, but I don't know. I think that we have this strength inside of us, Erin. Yeah. I, I think that we I think that we really do, and it seems to be inherent in the body's DNA to do this dry fasting because it adapts to it and then the body knows what to do it's it's preserving muscles and uh, you know healthy cells and it's and it's getting rid of the unhealthy cells so it's like it has this process that it knows what to do and if so it's it's not as it's not as um, uncomfortable as it sounds if you prepare for it in a medically supervised way okay so you are feeling confident now you're you're gearing up for 9 days which is a long time no food, no water. That's right. Okay. Right. So I was gearing up confidence. Um, I was, I, I, what was very exciting to me after the seven days, because you don't take a bath during the dry fast. You don't even put lip balm on or wash your hands. There's so there should be no contact with water or creams while you're dry fasting. But when I took a, a hot bath in their primitive banya afterwards, I, I couldn't believe that the psoriasis patches were all completely gone. I mean, I was, I, I just kept staring and running my hands over my arms and legs and they never came back. Like they never, ever came back. And that was six years ago. And, and there were, I just, I felt better. I felt more energetic. I felt 
I felt like my mind was coming back, that I had more energy than I had had. But I, but I, but I didn't know. I didn't know if I, I still had this tinnitus, this ringing in my ears. Um, I had, a, you know, I had a, a variety of things that I thought, well, is this really going to work? So I had, I had doubts, but I was also really eager to try it. And, and I, 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 at this point, I felt like my doctor was a trustworthy person because so far everything that um, he had taken me through was, was working really well. So I was gearing up in my mind though, because it still sounded like a daunting number, even after the one day, the three day and the seven day drive fast, nine days, that sounded pretty daunting. So tell us about the nine days. How, uh, how did you got through it? Obviously you're sitting here in front of me. <laughs> you know, I had some, I had some early issues just with so many people being on his site that I had trouble sleeping at night because people were loud. Um, some people don't sleep well while they're dry fasting. And so they were just up and loud and, um, I resolved those. So I didn't feel quite as energetic as I had on the seven day fast in the beginning, but I rallied and I was able to, they set up a tent for me outside so that I could just go be on my own. I was grateful for that. And, you know, they would come and check on me and I would, I would do my walks and I, I journaled, I listened to uplifting music. I was, you know, reading roomy poems that seemed, you know, uplifting and encouraging and everyone there was so supportive they kept telling me that I was courageous and doing a great job and brave and and you know as the days went by miraculously I would had no food and no water and my energy was getting better like I felt like I had my humor back I felt like my mind was working I could read um I I was I was marveling at how well I felt while I was dry fasting. So it went, the dry fast itself went miraculously well. I cannot believe I was able to walk the 10 kilometers slowly every day that he wanted me to walk. So I'd walk down this long dirt road to a bridge and slowly walk back. And so the difference though, when you break the dry fast is significant because when you start drinking so that you break it by drinking hot water and so after that I drank hot water for two days and then I was offered some watermelon which he says is very good for the kidneys after a dry fast um you feel very tired afterwards because then your body is the water is carrying out all of these things that were dislodged while you're while you're dry fasting and so you feel kind of feverish and flu like you have flu-like symptoms so I was terrified that it hadn't worked he kept telling me this is all normal just sleep this is normal so I went through you know a good few days of not feeling so well after after the dry fast was over but then I had this significant pop when all of a sudden those that cleared. And I just, as I write in my book, I felt like I had been reincarnated back in my body. But as my 17 year old self, I felt like I was, quote, shining and bouncing. I, I just I felt energetic and cheerful. Um, I had had all of these sinus infections. Um, while I while I had Lyme disease, all of that was gone. My sinuses cleared. The headaches were gone. I had no fatigue. I was able to be up out of my bed all day long. I immediately wanted to go back to writing and I my memory came back. And I thought, if you lose your memory, it doesn't come back. So I had just thought, well, my brain is just compromised. And everything, everything came back. And and so I was I was able to very quickly. Uh, after the the period of um, exiting, as he calls it, for three weeks, when I went back to uh, New England, I, I, it was like I had got my life back. I mean, everyone marveled when they saw me. They just, I had friends who were in tears when they saw me that they didn't ever think I could look so well again. So this was six years ago. 
this, this was six years ago. It will be six years ago in October that I left Siberia for the first time. For the first, okay. So what has what has happened in that six years? Do you have do you go back to Siberia? How are you feeling now? I mean, I'm I'm in Switzerland for the summer. I went for a 30 kilometer hike yesterday with my dog, and that's pretty par for the course. And after that was after a morning run. Um, I'm working on finishing an ac academic manuscript right now. And that's what my normal life is like every day. I skied uh, as many days as I could this winter. I've been writing like a fiend. I'm able to, you know, spend time with friends and family the way that I would like to show up in the world and um, make a meaningful contribution again. And I haven't, I haven't had to, um, I haven't had to seek medical treatment um, for a very, very, very long time. And I was, I was tested in a clinic in Switzerland after I left Siberia. They did not find any Lyme in my body. I get when I, every once in a while, I will have um, a blood panel done just because, you know, maybe I should find out what's going on in my body, even though I feel great. And um, I'm always told that my blood work is phenomenal. Um, so I, in these past six years, I've, I've written four books and I've, you know, I've been, I've been running, skiing, hiking. Um, I've had, I've returned to having my full life back. So no, it doesn't sound like you've had any major setbacks. Not, life. not even one. Not even one. No okay. setbacks. No setbacks. So this no is. No setbacks. This is all from this uh, initial experience. all from dry fasting in so Siberia. Looks like, yes, just in the Siberia. one time. I have not had any recurring Lyme symptoms since then. However, I must state that Dr. Filonov believes that everyone, regardless of having a disease or their state of health, should practice dry fasting in this modern world where we are confronting, you know chemicals and pesticides in our diet and various things and um, the the rising rates of cancer etc that everyone should dry fast regularly and so when he told me that as my sort of departing lecture he had wanted me to because my case was so severe repeat the nine-day dry fast at home two months after I went home I couldn't believe it. I thought, my goodness, haven't I done enough dry fasting? <laughs> but I did. I went home. I repeated the dry fast uh, two months later, um, just exactly as he told me to do following his protocol. And, and from there, he recommended that I dry fast one day a week. And, and I have, and I'm not always able to do that, not to ward off Lyme disease, just as the just healthy immune system maintenance. Um, and, and I have returned, he also recommends a long dry fast once a year for everyone. And even his family does them. So I, I did return to Siberia the following summer and the following year after that. And, but it wasn't because I was feeling sick. It was just, this is my practice. And his belief, his medical belief, is that if we dry fast regularly like that, we will age better, we will preserve our brain cells, we will ward off cancer, Alzheimer's, et cetera. So that's his medical belief. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, I'm just stating what has worked for me. But since I have you know, put my trust in him and this methodology brought me to a radical recovery, I've decided that that's that's what I'll pursue. So I have practiced dry fasting, which is now very easy for me to do. It's like taking a vacation from life and just going on a meditation retreat. That's really what it feels like. So I so I have practiced that, but not because I've had a symptom come back. Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned you know these other people that were there. Um, you know, like again, I think obviously in Western society and dry fast, it sounds very daunting and, and um, people might think of like an electrolyte imbalance or something like that, or a side effect that could come up, right? Like people are not eating or drinking water for nine days. That's a long time. Did you, you never saw anything like uh, 
that scared you like a side effect in anybody else while you were in Siberia? Or have you heard of anything since where you'd be like, oh, you know, maybe I should reconsider that or anything like that? No, no, I absolutely haven't. No. Uh, he has, and I've witnessed a lot of these, you know, I've, I've been watching all of his patients and I've even, I've sent people there. Um, I brought people there with me and they send me these emails saying, Michelle, I've got my life back. I'm, I will be grateful forever. Um, and I've, you know, I've witnessed their recoveries as well. Um, I haven't seen anything alarming um from his practice or any patients that were there under his care did you tell your did you tell your doc your uh west western doctors about this experience and did they respond absolutely oh they did absolutely um in fact dr phillips was delighted to be um in my book quoted in my book um he signed his release waiver glad to participate happy for me uh, my doctor in Switzerland said, almost with tears in her eyes, she said, Michelle, if all of my patients went to Siberia like you did, I wouldn't have any patients anymore. And I'd be so happy for all of you. So uh, so the, um, I also had a naturopath in New York City who I also quote in my, my book. I went to see him um, when I got back, not because I was sick. I just wanted him to see me and he was like, you got your life back. You got a major upgrade in your, in your uh, microbiome. And, and so no one was, um, no one was alarmed or scoffed at it. Everyone was just happy to see me well, all of my doctors. Um, yeah. I mean, that's amazing that you were able to, to find, to, to, to heal essentially. I mean, the, yes. given, cause it, you, you know, as you read your book, you're just like, man, this is awful. Um, and you think about, you put yourself in that position, like anybody can get bit by a tick, anybody could get chronic Lyme or, you know, another type of chronic illness. And you wonder like, what would I do in that position? You know, what lengths would I go to? Would I go to Siberia? But, and, and it was nice that you had a support system that was able to help you get there, give, you know, and that kind of thing too, because that, that matters as well. And when you're, you know, in those straits, like who's around you, who, what's your support system look like? So this it's so you mentioned, you know, we talked, uh, well, the, the war. And so this clinic, this clinic is still there in Siberia, obviously for geopolitical reasons, people aren't going there. Um, but you are going to go to another, is, is it just a, is it a workshop or um, when you're, no, it's a, it's a, there will be patients there. It's patient, um, okay. It's um it's a dry fasting clinic. So there will be patients going from the U S from Italy, um, a, a lot of European patients, he's, he sees with patients. So there will be a large contingent of, you know, people within, he doesn't like to take more than 30 patients um, going there yeah. to, to Montenegro. And he does, excuse me, he does still practice in Siberia. Um, but, but he's increasingly running more medical dry fasting clinics outside of Russia so that more people are able to come and attend. I wonder what he thinks of uh, the Western way of life. I mean, we have, <laughs> we have uh, more issues with, you know, our diet over here and uh, uh, chronic conditions, I think, from our lifestyle. Um, I mean, this is, he this is, is like, an, yeah, absolutely. He, he is aware of that and he has very good tips for a healthy lifestyle and yeah, you can imagine what those might be, but he's, he's, he's not a harshly judgmental person. Yeah. He's just offering what he has known to work medically for, for good health. Um, is there any evidence like, you know, people talk about peer reviewed journals, like on his website or something like that, if anybody wanted to read about this, I mean, obviously it's not approved. I, I'm just saying this for our listeners, this is not approved anywhere in the United States as like a a treatment, you know, your insurance is not going to pay for it. But for anybody who's curious, is there? So he he posts. Um, he 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 shares. He's written several books himself, and he does share uh, articles from Nobel Prize winning scientists like Yosumi um, Yoshinori Osumi, who won the Nobel Prize in 2016 for his work on autophagy in yeast cells. 
So he cited studies like that and other Russian fasting studies um, with a, there was a doctor in St. Petersburg um, who uh, worked in a psychiatric clinic using fasting with, with great success. But up until this point, there haven't, there aren't any peer reviewed studies yet. So I think that this is something to come. I think, you know, I myself would love to offer myself up to some lab and say, here, I'll dry fast for you. You can study my body. Um, or, you know, so I, I, I think that, that that is coming, but so far, um, what we have seen are studies um, by other doctors who have done restricted, restricted calorie diets in conjunction with cancer patients. And there, there have been more things like that, but with dry fasting specifically, yeah. that's not been done yet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I've seen, there's like a couple, there's a lot of studies with animals on intermittent fasting over here, but, um, and then there's some with people with intermittent fasting. I'm not sure yet if like, you know, for example, a randomized controlled trial, would they do dry fasting? Uh, my guess that would be difficult to get approval for. Um, but case studies like yourself, I mean, if, yeah, I mean, that's, um, a form of evidence and, you know, maybe folks can, you know, read about those and that kind of thing, but your book is really interesting. And, uh, I, I was glad to read it. And for folks who want to read the book, do you have a website? I do have a web. Thank you, Erin. I appreciate that. I do yeah. have a website at michelleslater.com. Uh, my book, Starving to Heal in Siberia, is available on Amazon and various other venues. Um, so it, it's it's out there. It's available. I'm I'm I wrote it because I really I felt it was important to share something that made such a radical impact on me and enabled me to get my life back. And I know that there are so many people struggling with chronic diseases and autoimmune disorders in Lyme that if it could help any of them, I wanted them to have it in their hands. So I include recipes for the exit and ways to prepare for the dry fasting. And I've worked very closely with Dr. Filonov. So everything that I put into the protocol section has been something that I've worked on with with him. And I just, you know, I just share my story and I have a lot of compassion for people out there who are struggling like I was. So I hope that the book helps them. It's also, I want to um, make a note, it's also available on audio because I know that when I was so sick, I could never have sat down and read that book. And I I made a big pitch to the publisher to, to please have it available on audio for people who, are just not able to read because of their yeah because and unless you a lot of people like to listen anymore to book like when they when they're driving or if they're on the subway or something like that like I like to listen to audiobooks yeah so, yeah yeah it's uh it's fun and it's also kind of because I, I feel like human first of all like yeah you have every right to share your story this is your story of healing maybe it's not somebody else's but it's your story and so sharing it with people is fine, but it's, uh, I like the spoken word aspect of sharing stories because it kind of, that's what we, that's how we all came, like, we used to do that, right? We used to like sit, sit, sit around the fire, sit around the dinner table and share stories. Um, so I kind of like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Well, Michelle, this was great. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to sharing it and people may contact you, ask questions, uh, and see what people think. You know, I'm sure you'll get, I'm sure you've gotten opinions all over the map. You know, people are probably still maybe, I mean, I read, I can't say I would go out and try it tomorrow, but I think it's, it's intriguing to me and, you know, but who knows, maybe if I get a chronic something or other and you try, you exhaust everything, maybe I would, you know, so that's, the I thing. mean, the, 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 there are, there are different um, healing modalities available out yes. there. It's one that has worked for me I'm delighted to share and I I appreciate you having me and I, I've enjoyed our conversation about dry fasting in my book starving to heal so so thank you thanks Michelle great to connect um and enjoy you're in Switzerland Switzerland yes thank yes. you yeah <laughs> nice place to be <laughs> absolutely all right Enjoy the rest Take of your day. Take care. Thanks, yes. you too. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right, gang. Thanks so much for your time and for tuning in. Let me know what you thought. 
go check out Michelle's book if you'd like. Please consider subscribing to the podcast. And if you can write a review, please do. If you go to the Apple page uh, where all the podcasts live, you can find Causes or Cures and review it. And thank you so much if you do. And please feel free to find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Uh, I've been having a lot of great conversations on my Facebook wellness page lately. I started this thing where I'm asking one question, just one question, just one question. And people are leaving some great responses. Some are funny, some are really sad, um, and some are some make you think. Uh, and the reason I started doing that was because... Um, you know, I think the start of any important change in your life or getting healthier always starts with awareness, right? Just awareness of what you're doing. And so I figured, well, how can I use this, you know, little space here to help other people create awareness and make myself continue to do it? You know, so it's just like this continual life exercise, I guess, until you're dead. I don't think you have awareness once you're dead, but who knows? Who knows? I don't. Um <laughs> But anyways, that's why I started asking this one question. And the questions are related to health, um, especially if you take, you know, a holistic view, how, you know, our health is connected to our jobs, our friends, our family, um, our livelihood situations, that kind of thing. That's what I mean by holistic. I don't mean like crystals and potions and all that. But um, anyways, it's a fun thing. It's been a great experience. Um, not too many trolls, not too many spammers. If I see something that's like a hateful comment, you know, I'll just delete it. Or if someone sees it first, they tell me and we delete it. And that's it. Um, no party poopers allowed. Um, <laughs> and that's not censorship, by the way. That's just, these. I mean, they're just hateful comments. Um, I, I'll even allow like assholes every now and then, but these people are just like, you know, next level hateful stuff for no reason. So I do, when, if I see it, I delete it. Anyhow, please let me know what you thought of this podcast. And if you have suggestions for topics or guests, please feel free to drop me a note and tell me what they are. And I'll try to, uh, to do it if you're interested in it. All right. And now for the closing quote. This is from Ben Franklin and really has absolutely nothing to do with this podcast, but I just like the quote. Here it is. An open foe may prove a curse, but a pretended friend is worse. Ha, huh, true. All right, guys, that's it. Hope you tune in next time and bye for now.